Yada night, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of Pacific Talks, where I engage in active conversations with my guests to talk about the challenges of our world through a Pacific perspective. For this new episode, I'm very happy and honored to share with you today a conversation I had with His Excellency President Whips, President of the Republic of Palau. In this episode, while he's in Glasgow for the COP26 summit, we're talking about climate change and the role the Pacific region can play in pushing for more action and commitments to tackle this existential threat. We're also taking a step back and envisioning all the challenges that our region, the Pacific, is facing right now, including COVID and the geopolitical tensions in the region. Finally, we'll hear his views on leadership and on hope, while he's helping his community to navigate those unique times we're all living in. Now, on to a discussion with President Whips. Mr. President Ali Yarana. Ali, and uh, thank you. It's good to hear you and uh, be able to talk with you about uh, the COP and uh, issues surrounding climate change. Yes, indeed, and, and welcome uh, to the Pacific Talks, uh, and thank you for taking the time for us. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to jump uh, straight in. Uh, as you said, you are in right now in COP26 in, in Glasgow in the Scottish winter. Uh, the COP26 is uh, a ma major milestone, obviously, in the fight for climate change. But unfortunately, the hopes are not too high for now. So after a few days on the ground, what are your personal hopes uh, for the outcome of this conference? Well, I think one of the things that we wanted to see, uh, beginning in the UNGA and continuing on to uh, COP and continuing on to the many conferences, uh, Oceans in Palau, Uh, on to Portugal and then back around again to UNJ and COP. It's just continuing the momentum. You know, when I came to this conference, um, I uh, just had an opportunity to speak with uh, President Kabua uh, before I had come. Uh, and he had asked me to uh, chair the uh, High Ambition Coalition panel for him because he could not make it. And when I spoke to him, you know, what really touched my heart was the, the fact that he said, you know, if we don't um, get any momentum going at this conference toward that 1.5 goal, we're gone. And, you know, that's so important to remember that we have islands that will be gone. We're already suffering the impacts of climate change with the typhoons and the and the sea level rise, and we're, and now the droughts that are affecting our coral reefs and our jellyfish, and, and and then you know the heavy rains that are causing mudslides and havoc, and then you know the strong winds destroying our homes and uh, that we weren't prepared for, and I think that's why if you know my statement from the opening plenary, I said, you know, it's really at the end of the day it's torture, and and it's it's like dying a slow death. You might as well just bomb us and get it over with if that's well, if we're going to continue on this path. And, you know, I hope that the people understand the message that we we need to turn this around. We need to take action and we need that we need the momentum to keep going forward. So it was it was great, to, first of all, to see that the United States is taking a leadership role once again, which they should as the largest emitter. They need to be um, active and they need to participate and they need to come up with solutions and provide funding to address this issue. Uh, just like the action that we took when it came to uh, uh, the vaccines and combating COVID. I mean, that's what we have to do. That's that's the kind of, um, uh, in, 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 uh, kind of uh, 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 coalition and, 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 and working together, like to get everybody together that's needed because This solution cannot just come from one country or a small group of people here and, and, and it cannot come from people operating in silos. It needs to be collaborative. It needs to be all of us working together to solve these problems. So um, I know it's a start. We'd like to see more. I, you know, India announced 2070. Of course, China and Russia weren't here. 
those are definitely big concerns. And then, of course, there's people that have their concerns because at the end of the day, it's, well, if we do this, then it's taking out of my pocket to feed that pocket. But I think the other thing that we'd like to see is, you know, let's let's stick to the commitments in the Paris Agreement. Let's finish the rule book. Let's get that done. Let's take care of climate uh, mitigation. I mean, let's make sure climate mitigation and cl- climate adaptation has adequate funding. It's great where they're saying we're going to reach the, the goal that we're supposed to reach in 2020 in 2022. Well, it's late, but it's better late than never. And uh, so that, 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 that's good. But the World Bank also tells us we need $4 trillion. So let's set our ambition higher. And I think that's the most important thing is we have momentum. Let's keep that momentum going. Let's come up with solutions to the real problems that we have. And that's the only way we're going to get through this. And that's the only way we can give our friends uh, around the world that are suffering because they're low-lying areas, like the Marshall Islands, like Tuvalu, like the small islands that we have in Palau, hope that there's going to be a better tomorrow. And we owe that to our our, our, our children, and we owe that to ourselves. So, yeah. Indeed. So that's how I'm hopeful. Uh, and I, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and well, unfortunately, this year the Pacific is not uh, well represented. There's only uh, four countries uh, present. Uh, in 2015, we remember that during the Paris Accord, the Pacific had uh, quite a strong voice and managed to put in the Accord a 1.5 degree goal. Uh, do you think that this right. time the Pacific will manage uh, eventually to still have the strong voice despite not being well represented at the conference? Well, you know, that's why we're trying to do all we can. I've had lack of sleep, but I've been trying to attend as many meetings, coalition meetings, side meetings, uh, to keep that momentum going. And uh, it is a challenge when there's only, uh, well, I I say there's only three of us here because really Australia is a huge continent. So, but uh, small islands, there's only three of us here and, and we really need to raise our voice and we need Australia to join us in the same fight and the same commitment. You know, one of the things that we need to do is we need to flatten the curve. Uh, We need to, you know, not only do we need to reach the target in 2050, we should try to cut emissions by 50% by 2030. Like we did with COVID, you need to flatten the curve if you wanted to to minimize the damage and the impacts. And uh, a dollar spent now is better than a dollar spent uh, 10 years from now in combating climate change. And I think that's what we need to get everybody on board to do. So... Uh, it is a challenge when there's few of us, but uh, it was good to see that there was a lot of uh, uh, partners from this, at least the Caribbean were here and they're very well represented and, and they talk about island issues. And I, we had some meetings with them uh, along with uh, uh, Secretary Blinken. It was good to hear their voices and, and they were also at the, all those different panels uh, discussing and, and raising the voice. So. It's not only the Pacific Islands, but it's the, all, all the association of the small island states really banding together. And I don't know if you saw that uh, Antigua and Tuvalu, of course, uh, mm-hmm. signed the yeah the Commission on uh, Small Island States uh, to really demand climate justice. And uh, I think that's that's what we need to do is we need to start demanding that if you if you insist on making us sink, if you insist on destroying our islands with typhoons, then you need to pay, right? A uh, polluter needs to pay. And uh, so, you know, that's, I think, the next level that we need to go to. And it's it's more to demand action because, you know, we, we want behaviors to change because that's the only way we can survive. And, uh, you know, once you lose those islands, you lose a culture, you lose, you know, how can a chief be a chief of an island if there's no island anymore? How can you claim that as part of your territory if it's underwater? Now suddenly our EEZs, they shrink because now those islands are gone. You know, those are real challenges that we have. And then when those islands are gone and those people have to relocate to another country, do they still have a country? (laughs) Are they part of that new country? Right? I don't know. If the Marshall Islands, if all the Marshallese moved to Arkansas, is that still the Marshall Islands? I'm not sure what we can call them. Are they still Marshallese or are they part of Arkansas? Are they Americans? You know, and th- th- that's really what we're fighting for. And if if we, the people, cause this problem, then we, p- the people, need to fix it. Dinosaurs got extinct because a meteor or whatever came and destroyed them. That's uh, a natural disaster did it. The, uh, the flood came. That's the reason dinosaurs are gone. Well, 
This is not what's happening. This is not a natural disaster. This is a human disaster. And the only humans have the ability to fix it. And that's why it requires all of us working together. So. Yeah, and and that was, uh, I guess, the sense of your of your speech uh, at the COP twenty six when, indeed, as you said, you you told the big countries you might as well bomb us. Uh, what was the reaction of those uh, leaders when they heard uh, your speech? Uh, did you have any feedback from them after that? Well, at least I got a uh, applause in the audience that was listening. So I think it struck a nerve, and uh, you know that's all we can do is continue to raise the raise the voice, right? Uh, of all the voiceless or uh, of the small islands that really are impacted. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that that continues to raise a voice. And that's why I, I'm, you know, I'm pleased that you called and you we're having this podcast because I think we need to continue to raise the voice. And it, now it's really the, 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 um, the media that can help us continue to sound the, the bell that uh, we need to continue the momentum. So, yeah, indeed. And, and I would also like to go, go back to a statement that was made by uh, President Biden at the UN General Assembly a few weeks back. Uh, when he talked about climate mm -hmm. change, he talked about uh, it being a borderless crisis. Uh, so do you think addressing climate change in the Pacific could require going beyond the current political structures and creating more potent, more coercive global or regional bodies for decisions to be taken, taken at that level, at the level that fits the challenge that is climate change? Uh, I, I definitely agree with that. I think, uh, you know, sometimes our political uh, differences keeps us apart, and we've got to figure out ways that bring every, every, everyone together in solving problems. Uh, one of the things I shared was, you know, we may, many times operate in silos, uh, and we need to share technologies. We need to share uh, innovations with each other, and, and 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 we need to share financing to make sure that we address the problem. And and, and you're right. We need, we, you know, like Biden said, we need to uh, find different ways of in, making that collaboration work better. Mm. Yeah. And, and on this note, uh, Pacific regionalism has been in some kind of transition time uh, this year. Uh, do you think it's a necessity mm -hmm. for it to evolve, for the region to grow stronger and to better adapt to the current uh, geopolitical context? What's your What's your vision for the future of our, our region, uh, regional collaboration? Well, you know, I, I think it's important that we have. Uh, I assume you're referring to the PIF and the Micronesian mm -hmm. uh, presidents, and, and and you know, I think one thing that I, at least, I've seen out of our, our regional cooperation is, is the Micronesian Brotherhood has gotten stronger out of this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's, that's good because that's, that's, that builds into stronger coalitions that can then those coalitions join together and make an even stronger coalition. So, you know, we stand up for issues together and it, it's, you know, it's not so much that uh, uh, we, we dislike a certain group. It's about principles that we fight for. And, and I think that's what's important is that you have values, you have principles, you find together. But at the end of the day, we're all one Pacific. We're all living this whole Pacific together. We need to collaborate and find better ways to collaborate so that our issues are pushed forward. And uh, yes, I, you know, we've, we've got to look at, uh, look at these organizations and see how can they be most effective. Uh, you know, let's take the PIF, for example. We have very different views within the PIF. When it comes to climate change, Australia and New Zealand don't really share the same values as the rest of the small islands, right? Uh, for example, I heard at uh, at the High Ambition uh, Coalition, I I heard our friends from Canada said we're going to stop selling coal in 2030. Did, uh, Australia didn't make the same announcement, but you would expect that as one of the members of the forum and a Pacific Island that understands what the Pacific Islands are facing, Australia should be taking the leadership role when it comes to this. Uh, so that's why I think sometimes w when we're too big of an organization, our voices get muffled. And, and when you're, you know, so as, as, as the Micronesian forum, we can, we, we are more free to say what needs to be said. And uh, that's it. 
and PS treatment and if it is just like specific in the cup yeah. against the So, you know, I think sometimes the uh, the way we feel in the, the, the MPS, the way we were treated is, is kind of the way large, emitter, large emitters treat small countries. As you know, Micronesian islands are small and, and you know, yes, I understand the rights of the majority and majority rules, but minorities have rights too. And uh, so I think there's there's definitely a, a comparison there that you can uh, parallel uh, with uh, these issues. And uh, that's why there's the opportunity to uh, be more, send a stronger message when you're not inhibited by the big, large group that says, this is what we should say. At least the Micronesians, we can stand up and say, no, this is what we believe. No hindrance. Nice. Uh, <laughs> no filter. <indeed>. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, when we, we talk about regionalism uh, and, and when what happened this year, and also when we talk about climate change, there is also an element that we have to take into consideration, which is the, the big tensions between China and the U.S. and the Pacific and Palau for uh, many reasons, uh, is standing in between mm -hmm. those two giants. Uh, and, and we all wait for those two countries to do something for climate change, yet they seem too busy kind of competing uh, with each other, with the Pacific in the middle of all this. Mm -hmm. So how can we as a region or even as small uh, as island countries, can we navigate efficiently in this context between those two uh, big uh, players? Yeah. So, you know, they, they spend uh, trillions of dollars on their military budgets, uh, both countries, right? Uh, we need to encourage them to spend trillions of dollars saving people's lives and saving and, 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 and taking care of, of the crisis that they have created. And I think that's a, it's so important to parallel that because you're right. Because of the conflict, because of their differences, uh, they're spending time... Uh, on building up their defenses when they could be spending time building up economies and building and improving people's lives by making sure that we avoid the climate crisis or minimize the damages to climate. So, um, you know, it, it's so important that we need to get our priorities and, uh, and it should be about saving lives, right? And saving communities and improving people's lives. I think that should be paramount and uh, you're right. Sometimes the geopolitical and Defense gets in the way, you know. Um, there's a lot of money being spent on F-35s and aircraft carriers and submarines. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was just recently we heard about the, the $100 billion that the Australia is spending on the submarine program, right? Something like that was a big number. But they're going to give $2 billion to climate change. Okay. Uh, but, you know, that's just the, the, the comparison and, and the weight of things, yeah? Uh, so uh, we, we need to, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. We need to prioritize what's important. And um, yeah, it doesn't have boundaries and that's the problem. We need to treat it as uh, it's an invasion. Uh, you know, I, and there were some things I didn't say in the speech, but it's, um, uh, it's like we're being invaded uh, mm. with the water, with the winds once again. Yeah. And, Literally uh, and, and metaphorically. <laughs> And so you were talking about uh, communities and the importance to save lives. So besides climate change and the geopolitical uh, conflicts, one other crisis that you have to manage as a leader is the COVID crisis. Uh, and we have seen that this mm -hmm. crisis has caused many divisions, many tensions within our own communities. So how do you manage as a head of state, as, as a leader, how do you man manage your community to stay strong and, and, and for you to continue to lead them uh, efficiently in those uh, in those troubled times. Well, you know, I think uh, the biggest challenge that we've had with COVID is is people losing their jobs uh, and uh, the fear that if we get COVID, we're all going to die. Uh, so we've got two 
very big uh, differences here and trying to balance those two opposites. So one of the, you know, the first things that, uh, you know, I was fortunate when I got into office is uh, the U.S. had become the, uh, the program of getting the vaccines out. And uh, I remember in the beginning of January, uh, the, the U.S. ambassador and myself going down and receiving the first vaccines. The first vaccines arrived. Uh, that next day, we went and got vaccinated, the two of us, to show how important it is to get vaccinated. And then, you know, just uh, the, the partnership with the U.S., with our, the Ministry of Health and the people of being able to get everyone vaccinated. So by really by the end of May, 99, almost 99 percent of the adult population had already been vaccinated. Uh, and then by the end of August, 99 percent of everyone over 12 was vaccinated and all volunteer. We didn't have to force anybody to do it. They just went and got it done. Uh, I mean, it required uh, communication. And then we started a travel bubble with Taiwan. This started back in, uh, in Mar at the end of March, beginning of April. And, uh, of course, then Taiwan got the more cases, so they shut down. And then, but in, in, in May, we were able to open up flights again to Guam and, and begin flights again to Taiwan in August. And it's been a challenge trying to get tourists back because people are still afraid to travel. Uh, we've had to put in restrictions, which are, you know, you got to get tested 72 hours ahead. When you come to Palau, you get tested again in five days. Now we say, no, when you arrive, you get tested at the airport and then again in, in five days. But, uh, you know, so far we have to thank God for uh, the guidance and, you know, really providing people with uh, understanding. We've had eight cases of COVID, all caught at the border, basically, and contained and no community spread. Mm. So um, we require that everybody comes and visits, has to be vaccinated, but still some get through and that's what we do and we catch them. And, uh, you know, you just have to do what you have to do. Uh, and most importantly, uh, we have to learn to live with the fact that COVID is here and it's here to stay with us. And we need to learn how to manage it and continue on with our lives. Uh, it's good news that Pfizer has said, I mean, the, the FDA has said now that they got the emergency use for the for the children, five to twelve, for Pfizer. So that'll be rolling out. That'll make people feel more safe. And hopefully, uh, you know, the our oceans conference that when we open up, I mean, uh, in in February, many more countries will already be vaccinated. So we'll have a um, you know a great conference and and really that'll hopefully begin the rebuilding and and bringing back tourists to, that we've lost over the last two years. I mean, it's been two years that we've been suffering drastically. You know, our economy has basically um, been destroyed. Uh, we've had to go into debt. About half of our GDP is what we've had to loan to keep going. And, um, you know, you have that COVID crisis along with the climate crisis. And you can just imagine as a small developing island how we are, what situation we are in financially. Uh, if another disaster comes, what are we going to do? Go get another big loan? To I mean, it just you know, it's just one disaster after another. So uh, that's why it's so important that we're at COP, uh, representing the Pacific and and raising the bell and saying you know we need cooperation and we need responsibility, and we need accountability, and we need radical action. And like the radical action that we took in COVID, we banded together, we found solutions. And what, in two years, we're going to tackle this crisis? That's pretty impressive. Why can't we say we'll tackle climate change in two years? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's yeah. what it takes. It takes commitment. And uh, I guess because when it comes to COVID, it was people dying, right? So we spurred mm. to action and we took drastic action. And uh, I think the with climate change, it's kind of, we can kick the grow a can down the road. But it's like a tsunami coming. And we need we need to make sure that we uh, do everything we can to minimize that impact. So, mm. thank you. Yeah, and that, and as you said, uh, the the crises are, are piling up right now. But one thing that you said at the beginning of our conversation that we need to maintain hope uh, for the people. So, uh, as a leader in in your situation, how do you manage to maintain hope for for people? Well, you know. Uh, 
That's what we talk about. We received the vaccine that gave us hope. We, we uh, you know, slowly open up. That's giving us hope. It's the same thing when we come to COP. Uh, you know, we hear the announcements. We continue to push forward. That gives our people hope uh, that we can do better tomorrow than we've done yesterday. And uh, I mean, that's, you know, you, you have to give credit to the hardworking people that keep us safe, especially when it comes to COVID. You have to encourage them and have to have people understand that we can get through this. It just requires cooperation, understanding. And, uh, you know, I, we, we believe in God and we say you got to trust in God and we'll, we'll, we'll get through this. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, Palau is a Christian nation. And we, you know, we we put God first, and you know, I think a combination of putting God first and, and doing our part, uh, we can get through it. You know, we always believe that all things work together for good, and uh, sometimes it's hard to see that, but uh, we have to have hope. Indeed, and and is it what uh, motivated you to 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 run for office? You've been sworn in as a president on on January twenty first uh, of this year. After serving as a senator, and you, before that, you were a successful businessman. In in this context, uh, where a lot of people are saying, "I wouldn't like to be in the shoes of a leader right now," what motivated you to to join politics and to reach for the highest office in in this time of our history? You know, one one of the things that I I think I've always been taught since I was young, and it's partly because of my beliefs, my religious beliefs. You know, we believe that we. Um, are all given talents, and, and God has blessed us with certain talents. And ultimately, we should use them to the best of our abilities to help others. And, you know, there's nothing, I think, greater than uh, helping others by, you know, either you're going to be a doctor or a teacher or in public service. And I think public service is another way we can help touch people's lives. And so, you know, when I was in graduate school getting my MBA, one of the things they said was, you know, you get your MBA to make money, but you really should think about how you can give back to the community. So even in, in business, I always took an active role in community groups, whether it was the Conservation Society or uh, being part of the chamber or or being on a board for a school or, you know, because I think that's a, that's an important role that we play. We need to use our talents to help others. Uh, and of course, uh, running a government uh, it gives you the ability to help everyone uh, and, and uh, providing hopefully a better life for everyone. Uh, and that's uh, really our motivation to run uh, was based on that. You know, we want to improve people's lives. We want them uh, to have hope in a better future. Uh, we, I like to use the term that, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our young people today see that uh, the only hope is to move to America so they can achieve the American dream. My goal is to, you know, one of our goals is to make sure that Palau, in Palau, you can achieve the Palauan dream. And hopefully mm. they can see the Palauan dream is better than the American dream because you can be in paradise and, and live, you know, with clean air and, and swim and see the beautiful jellyfish and, and you know, enjoy the beautiful forest and, and live a good life. I mean, that's, and, but provide those opportunities so that they can live a good life in Palau. And that's really uh, our motivation to run. And uh, it's not easy. Uh, of course, you have challenges. And the, of course, the biggest challenge now is besides climate change issues, besides the normal things that you have, you have COVID. But uh, tomorrow will be better. That's what I have to look forward to. And uh, you just keep trying, keep working as hard as you can. And I keep on, you know, if you look at my eyes, they're pretty, uh, droopy, but uh, uh, anyway, here at COP has been busy, and it's been a, it's been all about meeting people, uh, encouraging people, and trying to push people in the right direction, and keeping that momentum going. So you know, I enjoy it, even though I'm tired and exhausted. I still feel like you know every little bit we can do to push the push our our the, that forward, our agenda forward uh, is maybe it's small today, but in the long term, we're making an impact. And that's what it's all yeah. about. So that's what motivates me, is, is seeing yeah. uh, progress. So, yeah. Mm. Well, that's uh, deeply engaging. And, 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 and I get the word believing coming out of, uh, of what you just said, which is quite uh, inspiring. 
Um, so as, as we talked uh, about regionalism and, and, and why it's important for all, everyone to get together, like, like what is happening in, in Glasgow, uh, I would like to share with you what I usually do in this podcast is to share with you a quote from, uh, from a book uh, that I would like to have your, uh, your view on it. So the, the book I chose for you is from uh, David Wallace Wells, who published uh, last year this very uh, important book, The Uninhabitable Earth, where he talks about the future could look like uh, because of climate change. And he tells us this, mm. uh, you don't have to invoke some imagined law of the universe to explain the wreckage. You need to look only at the choices we have made collectively. And collectively, we are at present mm. choosing to wreck it. This goes beyond thinking like a planet because the planet will survive, however terribly we poison it. It is thinking like a people, one people whose fate is shared by all. And when I thought of, when I read this quote, I couldn't stop thinking about what Epeli Aufa, the great poet, is saying that the, the ocean is us and we are the ocean, uh, especially in the Pacific. Right. So, do you think that in somehow, uh, in some way, the Pacific may be because of its culture, because of how we work all together between our islands, we are in a good position to help the world think as a people and to inspire the world to finally act collectively on climate change? Hmm. That's a beautiful quote, and you know, I, I, I agree with what you are saying. That yes, we need collaboration and collective action, and uh, we are one. We are one. We are in one ocean. We are all connected, and you're right. The ocean is us, and we need to uh, um, help set the example so the rest of the world can see how we can work together, together collectively. To solve our problems, so um, it's very uh, it's very important. The Pacific uh, cultures and the way we are. Uh, sometimes uh, the Western way gets in and makes it so it doesn't work the way it should work. You know, and I'll share that at the end of the day. You know, they told us at PIF democratically we decided this, and I said we, it should have never gone to a vote. It should have been about consensus building and about us coming to a conclusion together so we can stay together. And that's where I think sometimes the we need to, we need to show that in our culture because that's what it is. You know, I I've been in a I chair a board and 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 it's a mix of people and we have westerners on that board and and the, the westerners said, uh, you know, this you, you let the meeting go too long. We need to make a decision now. Let's vote. And, and I say, you know, I want everybody to say what they have to say. And let's come to an agreement together, uh, because when when you when you force a vote now and people haven't said what they have to say, you end they end up leaving the meeting and going and attacking everything that you just decided. So uh, it's important to build that collaboration, and you know I think that's one of the unique things about our our cultures and the way we deal with the issues. And it's not you know, but sometimes the Western way is uh, you know. Uh, fighting with each other and getting airtime, but you know it's not, there's a time for everything, and there's a time when you need to to fight. But there's also a time when you need to listen and you need to work together. So, um, yeah, I think the, that's one thing about our culture, uh, at least the, in the Pacific, that's very unique. And we we call our Congress the House of Whispers because mm. uh, uh, that's. That was what it was meant to be, but sometimes now with television and YouTube, it doesn't. It's not. It, it, it kind of uh, presents challenges, yeah. but but you know, we have to learn to adapt. And uh, yeah, these are loud whispers uh, but, on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, sometimes there's a few loud whispers, but well, we'll you know, and uh, indeed. Uh, and my last question for you, Mr. President, and thank you for all the time you've given us uh, already. But uh, from your unique perspective as a head of state and uh, as, a, as a leader from our region, uh, what would be your advice or your recommendation for any person within our communities who would like to become an agent of change uh, for his or her community or for the globe in general, but could feel kind of helpless right now because of all the crisis that we have to deal with. What would you like to tell them? Well, you know, I think, first of all, um, one of the things that I've always believed is that we have to be truthful. 
We have to always uh, stand up for what we believe. And there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. But I think, you know, sometimes, uh, and to me, the right way to do is, is make sure that when you have the opportunity, speak the truth uh, about how you feel and what you believe and have no fear. Uh, sometimes our voices, we get muffled because maybe somebody's telling us, oh, that's, that's, that's too, um, too strong or that's not the right thing. But I've always been taught that you have to be truthful and you have to really express things the way they are. But that doesn't mean that you need to be violent or you need to uh, protest. Maybe, you know, one of the things I've noticed here is there's a lot of protests going on, which is great. I believe in protest. I believe in free speech. I believe that people should be able to express, but you shouldn't have to injure anybody to express your opinion. You shouldn't have to destroy property to express your opinion. You shouldn't have to do it in the right way. And, uh, and I think uh, that's what's so important is that we, we express our opinion, but do it in the right way and, 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 bring, and that way we can bring about change. Um, and I, you know, uh, I think people are listening. They listen to our young people. I think that's so important and we need to listen. And uh, so we are listening and uh, I just encourage the young people to uh, participate. You know, one of the things that I think sometimes happens is young people don't participate enough. Uh, they think, you know, that's just the government. And so it's good to see that the, yeah, there's young people that may be protesting or being uh, taking an active role in their civic responsibilities. You know, you have a power. You can vote. Uh, maybe the ones under 18 can't, but they can influence your parents. Uh, and understand what's going on in the government and, because it is your government. Sometimes we think the government is some foreign entity. No, it's it's us. It's made up of all of us. We all have a voice. So, uh, And the most powerful voice we have is to choose who our leaders are. So ask questions to your leaders um, and uh, and hold them accountable. You know, uh, that's it's so important and, and and demand transparency from them. So, um, all right, yeah. Well, thank you uh, very much for your time, Mr. President. It was uh, it was really fascinating to to listen to you and and your experience of uh, of COP twenty six, but of uh, leadership in general. And uh, we really hope that uh, we'll get something out of this conference, thanks to your commitment to it. Yeah, yeah. we have to remain optimistic. We have to have hope. And uh, it was good to start off the conference with uh, uh, Prime Minister Johnson saying, enough of the blah, 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 blah. We need to start to take action. So I think that's what we've begun at this conference. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. And uh, yes, anytime, reach out. So thank you. Bye bye. Maruru. Cheers. Pacific Talks is a podcast hosted by me, Philippe, and produced by Pacific Venture Media. If you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to subscribe to any podcast platform of your choice. You can also share it on your social medias or with your friends, family, or colleagues. And if you listen to it on a podcast platform, feel free to leave us a review. This is very important to us as it helps us to reach out to more people. If you want to share your thoughts and ideas following this conversation with President Whips, you can reach out to us directly by email contact at pacificventry.com or on all our social platforms. Until next time with another guest, another discussion on the challenges of the Pacific. Take care and see you soon. Mm -hmm.